Top Gun Maverick finally watched it in the dedicated theater space. Let's talk about it. So I'll break this into two parts. Part one, kind of talk about watching Top Gun in the theater, the technical side of things, watching it on Kaleidoscape and all of that, no spoilers, and then I'll put a pretty definitive split in between and just move on to some general movie thoughts. So we finally got down to here and uh, me, my wife, and a couple close friends of ours, and we, we watched it. So Kaleidoscape download, 68 gigabyte download, pretty decent size for a two-ish hour movie, two hour, 10 minute or so movie. My prediction is that the Blu-ray release, when it comes, I think in October, will be on a BD-66. And um, if, if I procure a disc and end up ripping it, or somebody does in comments, my, my guesstimation will be that the main movie rip off of that off of that disc, my prediction, is it'll clock in maybe somewhere between 50 and 55 gigabytes. So I think we'll see another one of those kind of clear um, size benefits, whatever it might be, on the Kaleidoscape side. Whether that directly translates into better picture quality, uh, th there's a lot of variance there, whether that might really be the case film to film, but the potential is there, and I think, I'm pretty sure, I'll update when the time comes, but my, my prediction is Kaleidoscape continues to reign supreme as the, the top choice uh, for sourcing this content. And in any case, I just watched the movie in full lossless Dolby Atmos, high fidelity, high bit rate, two months in advance of the disc release. So, so in a bit of a departure, a lot of films that do the aspect ratio switching um, on disc, that, that switching has not made it into the Kaleidoscape store versions. It did for Top Gun Maverick. And I was kind of not looking forward to that aspect of the film so much. In my opinion, I would rather really not have that happen. I would rather just have the movie be in a constant aspect ratio because I use lens memory and zooms with my projector. So having to zoom in and then having potentially things overspill or, or have black bars, I'm just not a big fan of that. But I have to say this one changed my mind on that in that regard uh, a little bit. One is that Kaleidoscape actually identified the aspect ratio um, as 185 to 1. So, and, and anecdotally, I didn't I didn't do a minute by minute count or anything, but I, I'm pretty sure it felt like more of the movie was in the 185 to 1 aspect than in the 235 or 240, because it was most of the, the action scenes of the movie. Pretty much any time they were in a plane, aerial dogfights, and, and all of that was going on, the, the aspect ratio was popping, popping taller. And then in the more quieter parts, simpler parts, talking head parts, and all of that, it would go more to the wider scope presentation. What I was afraid of is that Kaleidoscape or the, the movie would be identified nominally at like 240, and then it would put my projector in the zoomed up mode, and then it would show the 185s and I would have overspill. I'd have content going off the bottom of my screen. I would have content going up, potentially off the top of my screen, and it would force me to use features in the projector to mask the mask the image down but it was it was thankfully the opposite way and with that I think that is the better way to go for these type of films where the aspect ratio represents the taller one so when it so the projector zoomed to the 185 lens memory setting and when the sequences flipped to the wider there were black bars and the image was less tall in the center of the screen which was kind of a bummer again seeing this extra wide you know, window box, pillar box, um, in the middle with all of this extra dead space. But I still think that's the better way to go because at least the aspect ratios can change and all of the information stays on the screen. And I would say as well too, it didn't take me out of the movie as much as I thought it would. I've made some kind of complaints or, or some observations about not really liking the aspect ratio switching but in reality, it didn't really bother me. I did I did have the moments where a little while after it changed, recognizing that, oh, it shrunk down or it expanded back up. Uh, but I was really drawn into the content. I was really drawn into the movie. The big set, plane, flying action sequences were just so well done, so so great that I, you kind of like lost it. You'd get pulled in with the taller picture after it would switch back to the scope aspect ratio for a little while, then then my brain would realize, oh, okay, it, it we're looking at all these black bars and, and stuff. I, I guess in that regard, I'm okay with it. And also kind of coming to the realization that I don't think what you would want to do in a home theater setup 
is have a 185 to one tall picture, zoom it and mask it. You just like, you, you want that information above and below. If you, if you zoom and mask, you just cut off so much information. The context of like the cockpit views and where the planes are going. And you might not even see like if one plane is flying and another one is up here and you zoom and mask, this one could be completely gone. Yeah, I guess you deal with the black bars for the sake of being able to have, you know, the full tall 185 to 1 uh, picture information for the scenes that need it. Unless the movie was redone to be all 240 to 1, you know, you, you had the same amount of vertical information, but then they added the extra width information to those IMAX scenes. That would still be the ideal. I would rather watch it that way and zoom it up all the way and keep it zoomed in, but it is what it is. I, I was happier with it. Than I thought I would be and again I'm very happy with the way they metadata it and set it up so that everything played without uh, errant overspill above or below. I thought the soundtrack was awesome rumbling planes plane zooming swooshing through the air all around overhead you know Dolby Atmos in a home theater setting immersive audio just fantastic it did a great job the room did a great job rumble of those speakers tactile feeling in the couch when we're, when engines are firing up and, and one other thing about the K presentation of this film no special features kind of a bummer they really need to do a better job of bringing those special features the 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 day of the movie release I think we'll probably still see them on the platform at some point in time perhaps maybe more along the lines when the disc release comes they, they could get added that's kind of a common thing for K uh, is that the movie gets put up available to watch and then the special features come a little bit later iTunes has them um, and then one other comment on the audio side I, I generally tend to run a little higher on the audio I found with the anthem than with my prior Marantz in terms of like the negative number of DB to, to reference so on the on the Marantz pre-pro we would routinely watch movies minus 8 minus 10 watching movies on the anthem like getting down to minus 20 is is pretty loud actually I don't know why that di that difference exists there but in any case I tried to nudge it down more towards minus 20 for this film and I got maybe around like minus 22 or so uh, my wife looked at me and kind of commented that this this is sounding kind of extra loud so most of the movie I kind of dialed it back to minus 25 I might go in there probably will actually and pull the movie back up on the K jump into some of the scenes the big action dogfighting plane scenes and, and by myself and really crank it into the minus teens and and see what the room does uh, with that movie but I was okay with it I'm not I'm not a super 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 loud volume guy either in my life uh, and such never had been uh, but so what I would tolerate for loud or acceptably loud volume is is louder than uh, I'd say most of my family and guests but nowhere near some of the other guys <laughs> that I've seen or visited or, or even like the volume of some of the demos that were being played at Audio Advice Live. Uh, so to each their own in that regard. I'm going to transition it here. Fair warning, story spoiler alert for Top Gun Maverick. Spoilers coming in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. So for the movie itself, I thought it was a fantastic movie. I was enthralled. I was drawn in. The, the nostalgia, the setting, the characters, the way that they pulled off certain elements of tying back to the original film, advancing these characters in their lives, felt good, felt interesting, and felt um, topically, I guess, appropriate uh, to the original movie. I'm surprised that I haven't read any other spoilers about this movie being so akin to Star Wars. It's like, come on guys, Death Star Trench Run, anybody? Let's, let's navigate through a, a tall canyon full of uh, Sam's and, and things, you know, potentially shooting at us that we need to avoid until we reach the end where we have to make a targeted shot into a ventilation shaft uh, to blow up the, you know, bl basically blow up the base. And not only that, but the special son of the fallen hero is the one that makes the shot after his targeting computer fails. Use the force, uh, use the force rooster. So I don't think that was necessarily a negative of the movie, but I, I, kept, I kept having that run through my mind uh, as they, it, it, from the moment they set the whole sequence up of, of what the final action set was going to be. It's like, this is Star Wars Death, Death Star Trench run. <laughs> um, I thought Tom Cruise's character was really well done. I think there was a really nice evolution of character development 
from the way he was in the first movie to the way he was in this movie. Kind of being haunted by his past mistakes still, but being more mature and really caught between a bunch of or a variety of difficult decisions kind of that he need, needed to make in his life, like protect, trying to protect Rooster, trying to uh, live up to, you know, live, live up to what he felt the standard was of his deceased friend, making the promises and, and trying to meet the, the needs and, and desires of Rooster's mother and, and being caught between all of that and making decisions basically that, that almost nobody really liked, but he felt he had to make them and, and like shoulder the burden you know, of all of that. There was also kind of, that you know, that course came out through the, the course of the movie from the very beginning when when he decides to make the, the Mach 10 test flight and, and the comment that, like, you know, it's not about me or whatever. If I don't do this, then everybody else kind of loses. So, you know, him in the first movie taking these risks and doing these things because he was kind of, I guess you could say, maybe cocky and overconfident and, and all of that, but evolving later in life to still still being like that risk taker and doing kind of crazy things and unexpected things, but really doing them for different reasons and deep, like heartfelt on behalf of others or for the betterment of others. And so I think that struck really nicely as, a, as somebody that's aging myself, right? And looking back at things and decisions that we make and, and what they mean over time, Pro props to the writing in that regard and Tom Cruise's delivery of that character a second time. A lot of great homages to the first film. After the film was over, we were we were looking on our phones to say, who exactly is Penny? Where did she come from? And to see that she was essentially referenced in the first film with kind of what effectively was dialogue that wasn't necessarily meant to go anywhere or whatever, but they were able to extract extract a couple of specific references and turn her into a character that was that played really nicely in the film. Good moments of humor sprinkled throughout him walking in all burnt up from the first ejection into the diner. That was pretty good. Almost like Marvel Universe style type of humor. I think towards the end, the, the kind of the final act, the last big action set piece of being shot down, in some ways, right, the movie could have very well ended with, with Pete dying, taking the taking the missile shot and, and protecting Rooster. And I think that would have potentially been a fine ending. Um, and it seems like a lot of these actors, right, that had played roles 20 years ago, 30 years ago, when they, we come back for these sequels now, the operative thing to do is they want they want to die. They like they want these characters to die. It, it, I don't know if that rep, as an actor maybe it represents some kind of like special closure. So I think that would have been fine to have him had made that sacrifice. It's like a full circle kind of story. But then the movie went on from there, and and well he ejected again at the last you know second. Wouldn't you know? He's getting pursued in the snow. Almost the whole semblance of the movie would be begin to change a little bit are we going to do like a ground assault on a base you know how how was he going to get out of this and then rooster gets shot down and they steal the plane and, and get into the last aerial action sequences and, and such after that which i think was a great vehicle to basically get him back into an f-14 tie back to the first movie and the planes you know the type of planes that they were that they flew in the first film and as the movie was making that transition i thought to myself basically this is taking something that was feeling real, m more real, and and turning it into more of a of it maybe a generic type of action movie. But then I found myself saying that up until that point in the movie that I felt it had engaged and delivered good story, good quality, and set all of that up. That I I basically accepted in my mind right there that I'm good for suspension of disbelief for the remainder of this for the sake of some real cool throwback action set pieces and a little more aerial action. I'm good with it. I'm along for the ride. I'm not going to I'm not going to critique it. it. It didn't compromise the movie in my opinion and I still had fun all the way through following the story, watching those guys steal the plane in escape and and get back to the car to the carrier. Of course, giving Hangman his moment to kind of earn the respect of everybody and at the end, you know, everybody's happy, everybody's there. Nobody died. I was kind of actually surprised that we didn't lose a pilot through the course of the film. We lost the plane in training, but there really was no major death. Uh, you could say Ice's death, but that wasn't that was a dramatic moment. It wasn't it wasn't in service of the the depth of the training and the challenge and the story and all of that. And so I think afterwards, thinking about it a little bit more, I think kind of they made the right call because when you look at these two movies side by side, if you watch the original movie in isolation, right, Pete does these things. 
he acts the way he acts. He gets his friend killed with his recklessness. And then in the end of the movie, he kind of has a bit of a redemption arc. And if Top Gun only ever existed as Top Gun, then I guess, you know, you, he, he has that full circle experience. But when you take the original movie and now you put these two back to back, it kind of makes Pete's redemption at the end of the first movie incomplete in that the, the first movie is about the mistakes and the realization and some growth in establishment. And then the, this movie is about redemption. So with Maverick kind of being the redemption film, there really didn't need to be another weighty, heavy de uh, death in that movie, particularly a death that happened because of something Tom Cruise's character did, you know, recklessly or whatever to cause it. He's got this mentality of wanting to protect people and putting himself at, at risk to protect people and coming full circle with that maturity. So I think it's better that nobody else died by his mistake or hubris or whatever it might have been. And, and now you have kind of the dramatic dramatic moment film, so to speak, and then this redemption arc that wraps everything up. And everybody should, at, at the end of this one, end up happy. That was great. Um, I, I really liked that movie. Massive two thumbs up. Go watch it. Makes me want to watch the, uh, the original one again, just to revisit. Makes me want to go to the gym. <laughs> I look like these uh, look like these pilots do. And in any case, let me know what you thought about Top Gun Maverick. Sound off in the comments. Give me some feedback, thoughts, and all of that. Otherwise, please do all the regular YouTube stuff. Like, subscribe, hit the bell for notifications. Lots of ways to support the channel in the description below. Super thanks, memberships, merchandise, Amazon affiliate links. It's all down there, and I would appreciate anything that you may be willing to do if you're enjoying the content and all of that. So thanks so much for watching. Coming back for more home theater fun. And I do hope to do more reviews. I, I really want to try to get myself into that theater as new movies are being released topically, you know, for home watching, home viewing, and spin out some content reviews in this type of format. So if there's something specific that you want to see me talk about, present, whatever, when it comes to content reviews, also let me know in the comments, give me that feedback, and I'll keep that in mind 